Good morning, everyone. And two days before, we got some news, and it's interesting, right? And I love, you know, my LinkedIn feed is full of it, right? It's right, left, and center. We are just talking about, I guess, everything right now, right? So, and 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 it's interesting because you no, know, I have been. Interestingly, I was I was in Nal Sar, Hyderabad yesterday, and then I had a few panelists with me, and we were just talking about it, and we and we were just thinking that okay, how many pages is this? session for right how many pages is the session left for so the pages had earlier there were like 150 pages to the law and now there are like 24 pages to the law 28. so 28 <laughs> yeah so and, and and the question is like you know are we doing something right are we doing something wrong did the government do something that doesn't make sense right so what, what happened right and and that is something that you know we want to reach to conclusion right by the end of this so yeah, and that is something that you know goes on in my mind as well as I think a lot of people's mind. So just did a session just to make sure that you know we can kind of answer a few questions. But even before we start the session, I know you are here and you have an expectation, right? A lot of people, you know, ask me about ki bhai paisa kitna lagega, right? So I don't know <laughs> if that is because because, because a consultant That's a straightforward type. question. Yeah, <laughs> everyone it's, has. Um, as a, as a consultant, right? As a consultant, my my job is to fix a few things, uh, implement a few things, and you know, I I, I get I get asked the toughest questions right in the industry. So, uh, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place to sit at nowadays. So so the bill, by the way, be the beauty is that the name change from PDPB to DPDPB, right? So, so I think I think that is the biggest change, right, that we see. Or do you think there is some other bigger change than this? <laughs> So I, I keep sitting with my team right every day from the day that Bill is here, and we 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 sit together and we read about it and we keep seeing key boss what is it what has changed what is different today right and and we keep doing that right and we keep doing analysis by analysis changes by changes and I also have been reading a lot of you know a lot of things that you know people other people are posting online I am trying to read it again. I know people love plagiarism done by me, but right, I'm still reading everyone's analysis just to give the best analysis, right? And also to see how people are analyzing it, right? So I am reading a lot of it. Uh, I read a few good analysis as well, which have been published again by Indian companies, right? Beautiful, beautiful Indian startups, right? Around us, they do amazing work. And I am super proud that, you know, we as an industry have come to a level where we can answer our own privacy problems. We don't have to look to maybe, you know, Europe, right? We don't have to look to US. Uh, we are capable and we are proud that we'll solve it ourselves. So, and and, and we are here, right? It's, uh, it, it, it has been a journey that we as a country, we as a community come out and say, and I saw, you know, Sayongita's post today. I just woke up and that was the first post that came on LinkedIn to me. Uh, Sayongita is a very good friend of mine. So she, she what she said is, she said that it, it's amazing to see so many people posting about DPDP to see that everyone else in India is so ready that even if the law comes and there will be humongous shortage of people to comply, to help comply, we are ready for it, right? And we are ready for it. And, and that is something that, you know, that I woke up with today, right? Again, a lot of people would ask, why, do you, why did I open LinkedIn when I woke up? So that's, a, I think that, that we should leave behind, but I'm just saying. <laughs> so hello Arvind and hello Shashikant. Yeah, good to see hey, you. Akash. Good morning. Hi Akash. So let's get going. And I see a lot of questions in Q and A. I'll take them up. So guys, please drop your questions in Q and A, and we will be all set to answer you. So my name is Akash Singh. I'm your moderator today, and uh, I am the founder of Saru. Also, I am CIPE, CIPM, CIPD. Uh, I, I was one of the youngest FIPs, but I see that you know Saru Academy produced more than me, so. Yeah, I also founded Saro Academy. Uh, we What we do is we teach people privacy, right? And at Saro, what we do is we implement privacy around. So if there is a tool that you think about implementing, if there is a strategy that you think about implementing, or you're just thinking about doing 100 PIAs, right? Or obviously a gap assessment on the current PDPB, right? Then Saro is the company for you. And then we, the, we, we have two more speakers with us today. And uh, I will start with... 
director Saru Shashikant Akhilesh, right? And also a trainer at Saru Academy. So, so Shashikant, would you would you like to introduce yourself? Right. So, hi everyone. I work as director of privacy at Saru, and also a data privacy faculty at Saru Academy. I've been training batches for like almost twenty plus batches till now, and I also implement privacy across multiple organizations, be it GDPR, be it Singapore PDPA, be it CCPA. I've done all of them. So that's a little about me, and uh, maybe I win. It's up to what you now. Yeah. Hey, folks. Hi. Uh, my name is Advent. Uh, I'm presently. Um, a data privacy specialist at ASAP. Um, yes, so I have close to about 10 years of experience covering different uh, topics, but predominantly in the last four or five years, uh, been data privacy right now. I'm a CIPPE and CIPM. Yeah, looking forward for a great session today. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I think I think you, I think today, the average age of, I think the years of experience in privacy of panelists is definitely more than five years, which is, you know, which is also interesting to see. Uh, data storage and management. I will take it up. So about Saro, uh, Saro again. We we ourselves are ISO 2001-27701. We do that for our clients as well. We do some some work around privacy, gap assessments, GDPR, Singapore PDPA, CCPRA. Right? Those are things that we do. But we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Disclaimer: This is not a session where the speakers are representing their companies. Also, this is not a legal advice. Please do not take this session as legal advice and go back and implement something, right? You can call Saru first, right? And we can give you a better advice, but I'm just saying, uh, just for fun, right? But uh, understanding this is that this is not a legal advice, right? So think about it while you're implementing, read the law. Why, you know, again, why, what applies to you is a question that if you ask everything, the world will answer you. You know, if, if you if you keep asking why, why would this apply? How would this apply? Would it apply? If it applies, what do I do? All right. If you keep asking these questions, then you you, you don't even need Saro. You don't even need Saro. You don't need anyone. Right. If you if you again ask that question and you can say, okay, I have to do this, right? Then you honestly you don't need anyone, right? You 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 you're good that you're more than good than you're good than enough, right? Okay. So in today's agenda, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, it's a very big agenda and I see a lot of questions out there. So we want to be a bit faster today in the session as speakers also, because tons of things to kind of, you know, clarify and tons of people have already joined this session. So, uh, and it's a Sunday, right? And we had to do call a Sunday meeting for this session. So uh, want to do it a bit faster, right? So we'll talk about the scope and applicability. We'll talk about some key definitions. Uh, some things have changed, you know, some of the smaller smaller phases, grounds for processing, consent, obligations of data fiduciary, rights and duties of data principles, something around cross-border data transfer, right? Is it similar to GDPR? Is it similar to Singapore PDPA? Is it similar to DIFC? It's, or is it not, right? We'll talk about it. Enforcement and penalties, impact on other legislations, a comparative analysis will also be discussion. Perfect. So, uh, so Akhilesh uh, and Arvind, right? So, by the way, today there is a rule for speakers. Uh, you have to summarize things in two minutes, right? So, because we have too many questions and there are tons of questions in the chat box, right? And we expect yes. a lot more questions today. So, today we have to be, you have to, we have to be true to people who are listening to us. So, Arvind, over to you. So, the so first question goes to you. So, the question is, uh, what, what is the scope and applicability of the DPDP law? So the scope right now is more on digital assets or digital data. So, so we see that uh, the scope is dropped in such a way that hard copy doesn't come under the scope of this bill right now. It's, it's all is either semi-automated stuff, which is basically moved from hard copy to the to, to basically soft copy, or data which is already on hard copy I and mean soft copy itself, which is basically digital. So as you see, uh, there is no offline personal data. So uh, personal data process for uh, personal or domestic purpose by an individual this is very similar to how GDPR is drafted. And also records containing personal data that have existed, I mean, existed for more than 100 years. So, yeah, I'm not sure why this came up, but yeah, something more than 100 years probably is also not part of this bill. So yeah, in general, so whatever is going to be as part of your digital assets is going to be part of the scope of this, uh, this bill. Also, would you think, so I have a question for you. A company like Iron Mountain, right, who, who would, you know, just be having this hard copies because they manage this hard copies, right? So, so they, they are exempt right now, if, if you're correct, right? 
So if they are moving that hard copies and they're filing it uh, into a soft copy, then it will come, then the, this bill does become apl applicable to them. But if they're still having it only as hard copies, no, then the bill wouldn't be applicable. Yeah, so basically, if I go to a bank and I fill a form, right, and the data is, we all know that it's going to get digitized and get into the server. So it's it applies, the law applies. Yes. But if just it's just the hard copy, then it won't apply. That's I think that's where we are setting the base, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. We have a question. So Akhilesh, would you like to take this question? What is non-automated processing? Right. So non-automated data processing is, we can just think from an automated data processing perspective, anything that you're doing using digital means, right? Automatically processing the data, like storing the data in a digital form or processing the data, viewing the data in digital assets, right? That will be considered as automated. So anything that has to do with the physical copies, that will come as non-automated processing, right? Because it requires a manual effort, it will be stored manually, right? So that will be considered as non-automated processing. So India, like if you look at most of the government organizations, we still rely on the physical copies, right? So most of them will be considered as a non-automated processing unless they scan the data and store it somewhere digitally. Yeah, and uh, I think that's one of the fastest ones. I hope this answered you. We have like more than four questions here in the chat box. So uh, key definitions. So Akhilesh, what are the key definitions? And, and I don't see definitions changing from... Uh, the last PDPB to this DPDPB, but but what what what's your take here? Yeah. Exactly. So they have been kept consistent with the last bill. They have defined data fiduciary in terms of data controller when we compare with GDPR. But one significant difference, if you look at GDPR and the Indian law, is that they have included something called a significant data fiduciary. Again, this is not something new. It was there in the last bill also. But they have included, they started using significant data fiduciary if we are processing large volumes of personal information. But interesting aspect, they are defined data, but they did not call anything as a sensitive personal information, right? Which is a common call in your terms of your GDPR. But here they did not call anything sensitive personal information. So that is yeah, something Akhilesh, again we need to Akhilesh, maybe yeah. maybe as a country we wanted to give more focus on personal data. Like right, you... exactly. So <laughs> <laughs> everything falls under that. So maybe so it might be a change. What it is, might not be what, is, what is this definition of the new thing called harm, Akhilesh, right? And processing. So so one interesting aspect, right? GDPR does not talk about the risk, but here they always talk about risk-based processing, right? So in India, they call it as a harm, right? Harm in relation to data principles. So anything because of the like the processing of data, right? Any effect on the data subject, especially to bodily harm or theft of identity, anything to do or to a risk to the data subject that has been classified as harm. And processing? And processing yeah. I guess the definition is pretty much similar in lines with what yeah. GDPR talks like, or, or even what it was in the previous bill. So there's not much change. I mean, it's very, pretty much doing any kind of operation on particular uh, automated processing is what their operation is what they specifically mentioned here. So any operation which is an automated means come under the gambit of the definition of uh, processing. Yeah, and I think I think we have a very good question here, and I would like to definitely read it out before I move on. So again, Akhilesh or Arvind, whoever wants to take this up, right? So, so the question is, uh, but as we are heading towards digitization on, on a large scale, how do we predefine requirements to digitize the data or keep it in non-digitized platform? Now I can take that because um, if in general, the way we are going right now is, I mean, everybody is going, everything is going digitized. I mean, there's hardly anything in not digitized format. And this is for, for some years right now. So the bill not covering non-digitized assets is still okay because uh, at some point, the whole objective about this bill is to protect users' rights, right? I mean, privacy rights. Now, there is very little harm which can happen when it's in the hard copy. Uh, there can a lot more sharing can happen, a lot more disclosure can happen, and it is in a digital format. So uh, this this bill moving towards that direction, uh, I, I have no, I mean, I have no problems with that that way. Exactly. So whatever Avin said is right, right? So adding on to that, if you look at even the government stance, everything they wanted in the form of digitization, right? Even the payments, even if you look at the processing that is happening at the government offices, they want to move to a digitized form. So as they are going that way, so this bill is also in the right direction, covering most of the digitalized assets. So I'm also okay with that because anyways, physical assets, the even the harm is comparatively less when compared to a digital data. Yeah. 
<clears throat> okay, three more definitions to go. Loss, public interest, and gain. Right. So, Arvind, would you like to take them up? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, loss is basically here. It specifically says it refers to a loss of property or interruption of supply or services. So, anything with this interruption or supply or services is basically a loss. Gain is, I mean, in, it, gain it could be in terms of could be in terms of remuneration, could be in terms of monetary benefit or financial benefits, which an organization may get. Uh, by not following proper uh, properly the regulation is what gain again is what here is defined as so public interest is something on the interest of the of, of the nation for the sovereignty and integrity of the of india so that's what the public interest is talks about and we will we will discuss public interest in in the future slides in the other slides as well yeah yeah and okay so so, so I, th I think before we started the session somebody asked the first question is what 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 is it all about exemptions who's exempted who's not exempted right uh, who we have to catch, uh, who the government will not catch, right? Who is the government exempted, right? So last bill, you know, when it came, it had, uh, it was under under a bit of scrutiny because of, you know, public organizations getting exempted from most of them, right? And if you look at any other privacy law, that is not happening. Obviously, I think when we're looking at some laws in, uh, in like nearby countries, right, rather than as far as Europe or US, uh, public entities were being ex exempted and we we're expecting them to be exempted. But in India, you know, there was a huge scrutiny that that should not happen. And then the bill has changed, right? And the bill has changed with a lot of scrutiny as well. So, so Akhilesh, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think about these exemptions, right? And, and, and who's there, who's not there? Can you just, you know, tell us about it here? Yeah? Right. So as expected, the judicial has been exempted, right? Processing is necessary for the performance of any judicial activity or processing of personal data of data principles outside India is undertaken to fulfill contractual obligations. So in a sense, if you look at overall exemptions, it has been that exemptions has been limited narrowly, right? When compared to the last time, but still there's a quite a set of exemptions that are applicable using the bill. So like example, if you look at the central government research, right? Like they, when they collect the personal data for research statistical purposes they're still the government can collect a lot of data so that is there the government is still exempted from most of the activities unlike how gdpr applies very stringently even to the government entities so there are quite an exemptions around that but compared to the last draft this is much better in terms of the limitations that are there yeah i mean if you take, yeah mm -hmm. just to just to add on yeah, it's pretty much in line with what gdpr talks as well and the regulations double regulations talk so when if you, if you look at the first point with this bit of processing necessary for enforcing a legal right or a claim this is very much in line what what gdpr talks or the other reg regulation talks you can't uh and with respect to processing necessary performance of a judicial or uh function so i mean again uh these are some things these exemptions are carefully drafted and i, I feel again uh, agreeing to akilesh that this is very much how it has to be and how it, I mean, much better than what it was drafted in the previous bill. Yeah. So grounds for processing, right? So again, I, I want to set context, right? I want to set context for everyone. So grounds of processing are like legal basis of processing. How do you process? How do you process lawfully, right? How do you process lawfully? So basically, if you look at GDPR, you cannot process personal data, right? It's, it's ex You cannot process personal data, step one. Step two, yes, you can, but if you can find a legal basis of processing, right? You can think about, okay, I took consent, I signed a contract. Is this for public interest? It is. There is a legal basis. There's a legitimate interest. That's GDPR for you, right? But let's talk about DPDPD, right? So Akhilesh, what's these grounds of processing we're talking about? Right. So if you look at the grounds of processing, one interesting aspect, right, when compared to the GDPR, one, the general consent is available in terms of processing of personal data, but they've also added something called as a deemed consent, which is in line with US or Singapore PDPA kind of processing, where if the processing is expected by the data subject. Like when we share a data, like for example, when we are swiping a credit card, right? We expect the organization to process the credit card information. So in those cases, it is deemed that the data subject is already consenting to that. So we need not take an additional consent for that or provide an additional information around that. So that's an interesting take the government has taken, like little deviation from GDPR and deemed consent was last time not clearly defined, but this time they have provided additional details when the deemed consent can be taken. So apart from that, if you look at the additional principles that are available in the, the legal basis that are available that are pretty much in line with GDPR. So like, for example, if you take public interest or 
for compliance with judicial requirements or the legal requirements or the legal obligation that they provide and so that's those are the four processing that they have provided but interestingly they did not mention directly about the contract they talked about the consent and the deemed consent but they did not talk about the contract that yes, is so contract is, contract is not an option in terms of legal basis uh, we have mm. we can either take consent or otherwise right. if consent is not there then because of any other law that we are processing the data for we are processing the data for it so that Actually. is that is the kind of you know summary that we have for you but i have a few more questions that i just want to quickly answer uh is S- if spi is vishal has asked if spi is not defined then what do we do about it see all data is treated as pii and similar provisions and there are provisions and requests in the law which says you have to protect data right like article 32 of gdpr uh, we also have a section here which says yes uh, you have to keep data secure right so so it gets covered in like in that full span right it is not going to get covered in a different process, different way at all <clears throat> so Okay, so does processing include uh, conversion from offline to online because this act will also have a purpose? Okay, or is it considered as similar to collecting only? Uh, so Freni has asked, does processing include conversion? See, Freni, uh, see, in, it's interesting. It's a very great question. So somebody has asked, what will it be? Will, it, will we call processing if somebody is giving us uh, somebody standing in a bank and I'm signing a form and that form is going out to a digital team and digital team is scanning the form and you know extracting the data and data is going into my database. Uh, it will be processing, right? So anything in processing that is getting to digitize form is processing in India. And okay, let me repeat this for all of you, right? <clears throat> Any and everything that is going to be digitized and going to be used for any purpose will be processing. Processing spans on everything. If there is PII, it's processing, right? Okay, perfect. So even before I start the consent session, right? Consent is is, is the hot topic, right? The hot discussion of the market right now because if everything is about consent today, right? It's deemed consent as Akhilesh mentioned it, but I have a question that I wanted to answer. Okay, yeah, Sylvia also asked the question. So yeah, I knew this is, you know, this is gonna come, so. But somebody has asked a very important question and I, I've been reading this question and able to answer this till now, but yeah. So, okay. So I'll start with this question again. So does obtaining consent, right? Does obtaining consent, right? How do we notify the individual, right? Is it a notice or somebody sold your data to someone, right? Or you just got a notice. So, so what is this all about? And this is, I think we're going to spend some time here. So let's start with, you know, initial questions to, to my speakers, right? To the amazing folks here in the session, right? So, so Arvind, right? Let's, 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 ha- let's ask you this, right? So, so first of all, Arvind, what is consent, right? What is consent? Consent is basically something where you are accepting for processing. Basis. No means a no, right? That's no means a no. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it's sometimes something that you're freely giving, um, uh, where there is not too much pressure on you to, to say okay to processing your person data. Where before that, prior to that, is obviously somebody asked about notice and some is notice given or required here. So uh, the law, I mean, again, the regulation or the draft bills clearly specifies that you need to have an itemized uh, notice that needs to be provided. And uh, an itemized notice is where basically you need to, I mean, provide more information on how you're processing, why you're collecting, who are you as an organization, what is your rights and stuff for like that. And based on that, um, then it is the I mean, data's principal here uh, whose call it is about giving the consent. And based on that, he can freely give the consent and at some point whenever he wants. And he can also revoke it at a given point of time uh, whenever he feels like. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So let's let's talk a bit more about who is a DPO in this case scenarios, right? And and should a DPO be a mandatory requirement in the law, in in this law? So Akhilesh, what, what's your take on that? Right. So if you look at how the consent requirements are there, we need to clearly give a privacy notice to them informing for what we are taking the consent. So in that privacy notice, the law has mandated to provide the DPO details. So in case if they have any concerns or doubts, they can reach out to the DPO. So if you look at consent, right, it's a clear choice to the data subject. They should have an option of yes and no. It's right. It cannot be like forcefully asking them to agree or giving them an additional discount 
around or manipulating them to provide yes right it has to be a clear choice for the data subject so in order to do that the dpo details should also be present so that the data subject can have the queries resolved uh to answer your question akash uh, is the dpo mandatory as per uh the draft bill i uh, the dpo is not mandatory it's only mandatory for a certain organization which is significant data fiduciaries now obviously the draft bill doesn't say who are those significant uh, data fiduciaries that has to be defined or that that call has to be taken care of by the data protection board uh but at this moment that's what the at least the draft bill says but but we but we read about it but i also read about it right. so end of the whatever call you take right a lot of times the question will come back to the company itself right and i know how how it works right i know how it works what will happen is the government will say you know will come out with some guidelines and interestingly all the companies would be indian fortune 500 you know or big enough to process like insurance you know you're looking at banks you're looking at credit card companies anybody who's processing data in terms of volume the first requirement of significant data fiduciary the first line of that statement says volume right it will depend on volume right so the people who are playing the volume game in india right and not saro guys right we are still marketing in the right fashion so just fyi so yeah but coming back to the point <laughs> so <laughs> so yesterday i was in a marketing conference and all the marketers uh, were talking about you know how they would take how they are doing marketing and somebody said that intent marketing right somebody was saying that even if you scroll on your gmail and you are searching something on your google then there are tools now who can, just because you are scrolling something so you have a intent maybe so you can use intent to market to the people and i was like i i was just you know blown away i was like this is this is not something that i would consent for right this is this is something that is yeah it's 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 going uh, interesting and also i don't know if you guys read about this case of amazon in uk <clears throat> alexa so there there was a there was a, there was a case of murder right there was a case of murder and <clears throat> in the house there was this alexa device so uk authorities you know made sure that amazon gave back you know the 3 days of recording of alexa so understand what happened for 3 days that UK authorities asked Amazon's Alexa to give the recorded data. There was recorded data, so it is not a joke that it is listening or not. It is, and it is also recording, right? It is also record, and this is not happening in India. This is happening in UK. In India, what is happening? You know, you leave it behind, right? That's uh, you know, yeah, we should leave that behind. Right. Agar yeah. interestingly, right, at least is not even anonymizing or something like that. Straight away to the customer record, they are storing the data. Yeah, right. and then straight away we are storing. And then this bill, this bill, this bill is not the strongest bill in the world. A lot of people, a lot of our privacy professionals have said that. But this is going to change our future, right? If this gets passed, we are looking at a new world, right? We are looking at a world where consent will be necessary, right? And we will be more important. And our right. the us doesn't have a right to privacy europe has and india has so we have a right to privacy it's a fundamental right right and to protect our fundamental right we needed a bill right and obviously if we read about this in detail we have civil courts now right which will work as data protection authorities right and civil courts you know we will have arbitrations and all the best things in the world to protect our fundamental right right so yeah we will see a lot of things guys right and and it's uh, okay uh, it's interesting question uh children consent right so somebody has asked children consent so uh children uh below like anybody below 18 years of age anybody below 18 years of age uh will need a verifiable guardian consent not just parent a verifiable guardian consent it depends on what format right if you are a school you know uh, my my teachers you know when they used to give me escalations in school they used to ask put it on my diary and i used to ask me to get it signed by my parents so <clears throat> depends you know depends on what what area you are right consent and fiduciary concept see fiduciary is the data controller here right so i i'll kind of explain this again right so kind of point this out again so so they are vague and ambiguous in the bill but 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 it's see everybody who's pro- anybody and everybody who's processing data or who defines how to process data kind of becomes a fiduciary 
right so there are tons of concepts of fiduciary then a processor then a sub processor which have not been defined but ultimately they are already defined right and that is how we want to treat everyone around us right so fiduciary is the controller but if you look at other forms of people like vendors 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 they will be treated in a very similar fashion because again the security requirements are, are have a reason and the consent requirement is there so consent will play around so i think b2c companies especially or the companies who are in b2b catering to b2c because of consent right it will this will play beautifully for them so okay one question one quick question i think i have not answered this so this is to arvind or akhilesh who want to take this up so is dpo a mandatory requirement for companies no not right now not at the moment yeah at least the bill says that it's only for uh, significant data fiduciary so yeah. but uh, it's a mandatory requirement for significant data fiduciary yeah yeah right but interestingly akash if you look at how the significant data fiduciary has been defined and if we compare with gdpr right if the volume of the data is more or if the data that we are processing has a significant harm to the data subjects right so then will be considered as significant data fiduciary so in that case a dpo will become a mandatory thing so how the law, the people interpret it right the board interprets becomes very critical in this scenario so if you want to be on the safer side or if you want to be the better side you need to have a dpo that will be a good practice to be implemented that is also something we need to take into consideration Yeah, GDPR is very clear, Mr. Khwaja. Right, it's uh, very clear in terms of processors, sub processors. See, GDPR is not is not a law. Europe doesn't have a privacy law from what two thousand sixteen, two thousand eighteen. They have privacy law since nineteen ninety five, right? Since nineteen ninety five, they're talking about this. We have just talked. Exactly. Started talking about it, right? So if you think that uh, we will just you know copy paste something that is in Europe, uh, why should we? First of all. right why why should we because are we we are not ready for it as a country so the requirements that were there and the less exemptions that were there in the past law it it could have been a nightmare and could have impacted our economy but now what this law will do it will change and it will at least give us consent and maybe in another 3 years 4 years 5 years down the line with arbitrations or with a new law or what with the upgradation to this law we will be you know 100 times better as a country and will be much more secure to predict this okay consent manager okay this is this we should definitely take this right now so okay so consent manager right consent manager so so this is this is a new interesting concept right it's, it's a consent manager so what happens is a consent manager is a third party software right what it will do is it will get embedded into a data fiduciary's consent management framework Make sense? Perfect. You're here to know. Okay. So what a consent manager will do it? It will act as a tool, and it will act as a third party between the customer and the fiduciary, the controller, uh, to kind of you know get that consent ball rolling. Right. That is the bit of concept of consent manager. So it's like a tool which the government has said that companies can take or cannot take, but we're still looking at some more guidances around that. but but that is a new concept that we have right so what i feel what is going to happen is uh, to get more assurance or consents uh, people like significant data fiduciaries or you know smaller companies who people don't want to give data to will go for you know things like consent manager right in future right and we'll have to see how that it rolls right but obligations to data fiduciary right so let's talk about the elephant in the room right so okay so so arvind right so so what what what's what do you think are obligations right that are on data fiduciaries right. so Arvind. yeah so around uh, the obligations of data fiduciary is um, it's basically talking around having security measures you, you make sure that the data you hold are accurate and up to date from time to time you take parental consent wherever there are children involved you you basically you seizing proper when you see uh, you see to retain personal data when say the retention is no longer required for the purpose or if the regulatory requirement I mean, requires you to have such data for a longer period so uh, it is again uh, kind of in line with the other regulations out there but um, not not too much surprises out here in general because uh, it is it is what is expected usually from a data fiduciary 
right if you look at the obligations right they're pretty much similar to the obligations that have been defined under gdpr right like implementing the security measures technical and organizational measures or maintaining the accuracy of data or the completeness of data so they're pretty in line with what we have been doing in the privacy so nothing something extraordinary out of nowhere there nothing is there so it's pretty much in line with what we are de dealing with privacy uh, how do you feel about doing away with data localization? So yeah, we, we went away with that. So we're just going to leave that. So, so what happened is, uh, so data localization was a big issue last time, but uh, we, I think, have kind of you know moved away as a country from data localization as a hardcore requirement. But uh, Arvind and Shashikant, do you see anything more about data localization now? I'm actually quite interested to see how this goes because there are other regulations, especially in the RBI sector, they they are asking data to be localized and kept in India. Um, I feel there will be more guidance on this, and this will probably be you may you may rely on sector specific regulations to come up their own how they want to um, come up with the regulation with respect to the data localization. But it will not be as straightforward as how it is not defined or said in, in, in the in the draft bill because also the draft bill states that there may be certain countries which may have adequacy decision and where you may transfer it. Um, but again, um, I feel especially with, I mean, being in fintech right now, I know RBI may, may have something to say about this and there may be other sectors, uh, I mean, other regulatory authorities also uh, in India may have something to say about this. Yeah, exactly. I'm also in line with what Arvind is saying, right? So data localization may be not directly applicable, but because of the other sectoral laws, it will be might be applicable, or they might ask, still ask us to keep one copy of data within India. That might be a still a requirement that might come up, even though they allow cross border data transfers to certain destination countries. Yeah, I'll go to Q and A now. So, so if consent is not provided, right? Whoever wants to take this up, you know, show of hands, speakers, right? Show of hands, right? So if consent is not provided, can you withhold service? Can divide, can we divide it into two buckets? <clears throat> One, where PI is necessary to provide the service. Second, where PI is collected for marketing or providing additional services, right? So if consent is not provided, can you withhold service? Wow. Yeah, Kilesh, what do you want? So if you look at consent, right, for example, if you look, go to any shop, right, buying an electronic goods and to provide certain services or warranty or guarantee, in that case, you cannot say no because to, pro to provide the service, they require your personal data. So you don't have an option in there, but you don't want the service, right? For example, you're buying a cloth, right? And you don't want the guarantee. In that case, you have the option to say no. So in some cases, you'll be mandated to provide the details. In other cases, might not. But it, if it comes to marketing, you will have a clear choice and you can take whether you want to provide consent or not, right? So it depends upon the other service details that are there to decide upon whether mandate or not to be identified <clears throat> sure next question uh dpo details <clears throat> need to be given in the consent pop-up or in the privacy policy linked to the consent pop-up DPO uh, details where to give i guess this needs to be in the notice so more in the uh, privacy policy or the external privacy policy or the notice yeah i would actually okay. shil Pierre has asked so can you throw some light on examples of deemed consent what are the exemptions of consent and covered under D consent? <clears throat> is the employment data exempted from, see again, employment data is based out of contract, right? So that is anyways out of this conversation, right? So we'll just keep the conversation on the first two questions. So deemed consent is also known as, you know, just a secret to all of you, right guys, whoever has read GDPR, it's known as implicit consent, right? Okay, perfect. So Akhilesh, yeah, and over to you. Can you throw some light right. examples of deemed consent? Exactly. So deemed consent is a very simple concept, right? If a data subject expects that when I provide the data, they are going to process it, right? That is considered as a deemed consent. For example, when we go to a shop and purchase something and provide our credit card, right? At that point of time, 
as a data subject, you are very much aware that if I provide my credit card, they're going to use a card to do the transaction and my details will be shared with them, right? That's a form of deemed consent, right? In that case, you did not provide additional consent details asking, are you okay to process your credit card information, right? So that is exactly how deemed consent works. If you're expecting that to happen, then that will be falling under deemed consent, right? When, when you sign up to a marketing mail, right? Or when you add a product to the cart, so that will be considered as a deemed consent because you have shown a sufficient interest to that and people might send a marketing email. If you're not okay with that, you, you have an option to withdraw your consent. Even in the, just like consent, in deemed consent also, you can withdraw your consent in certain cases. Yeah, so just to add on to what Akhilesh is saying, so deemed consent is a lot more, it just, it is, it is, it's, 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 a, it's a culmination of a lot of other lawful bases which you probably see in other regulations like GDPR. It is which 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 includes your legitimate interest, includes your public uh, interest, includes uh, vital interest, uh, includes if in case in, in case if there is a uh, in case if there is a judgment or an order or things like that. So um, so it's a combination of a lot of other points or other lawful bases which you see in other regulations like a GDPR. Yeah. So but I mean having said that, I mean it's a very new term which uh, which we have come up with. I mean a deemed consent. I mean uh, I mean. Being a new regulation, I mean, coming up with a new regulation as such, I mean, uh, it's a quite a steep step or a big step which India has taken up coming up with a new terminology in general because this is not something which is there outside uh, in any other country <clears throat> right now. Yeah. And so, I, and but, I, in, but in general, and I, and I hope it doesn't, different. and I hope it doesn't go wrong, right? And and companies don't take advantage of it because I I know these these are the things which which sounds like conflict already and will definitely go to you know courts. And everywhere, right? So, so that's that's the reason we would have to go through the uh, to through the provision which are being given under the uh, deemed consent and not just go by the heading. It's important to go through the provisions as well. So so okay, there's a question. Next question. So so does the bill cover online tracking and monitoring of individuals? Uh, yes, it does. Right, it does. It's it's anyways talking about PII means it's talking about everything, right? So if you're doing online tracking and monitoring of individuals, just ask them, right? Just ask them, right? And if it, if you ask them, it's totally fine, right? That's what the Bill is Mr. Varun. So right to be forgotten. Do we have a right to be forgotten, Akhilesh? Like JPR? Arvind, we like take this up. Yeah, I mean there are I'm not sure if there's right to be forgotten, but the right to be erasure, if I'm not mistaken. So uh in case um in case basically if if the if the data fiduciary is collecting or processing person information which is not required at that moment and the purpose doesn't seem fit then the data subject or, or data principal here can request for erasure of data. Yeah. So, so basically if I, if I revoke consent, it's erasure, right? It's, it's that, it's that. Yes. Ideally, uh, I mean, ideally, I mean, but sometimes there may be information which may be required for a regulatory purpose or for something else, but so they may hold the information for some more time, but yeah, I mean, it should be deleted at a given point. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so uh, there was this, so I have a question, right? I have a question for all of everyone in the session, right? Okay, so guys, let's answer in the chat box, right? Now, this question is for everyone, whoever is listening to us, whoever is here talking with us, asking questions with us. So if, right, if you, if you buy something, let's say from a shop, let's say you buy something from a shop, then, and you bought, let's say, what, a SIM card, right, a SIM card. So do you think it is, a deemed consent that they are going to reach out to you for selling something else. Yes or no? Rick question. <laughs> exactly. So for example, if you purchase a SIM card, right? And let us say, and the organization wants to sell something like a collar tune or something additional as per their services, they might be able to do that in some cases. We, again, depends on a lot of conditions here and there, but they might be able to do that. But they cannot sell your information, right? Like to what happens currently, just like to a bank or any other agency, they cannot sell your information using deemed consent. But they might see it's always about what are the reasonable expectations of the customer. So in that case, uh, this can marketing can be a reasonable expectation and they might be able to do that, but not other way like selling your data, they will not be able to do. Arvind, you can add on to that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I am, yeah, I totally agree to what Akhilesh said. I mean, this is pretty. Much, I mean, this is a very tricky, tricky question. I understand, but yeah, I mean, at least GDPR at least answers this question. GDPR says that you can do it, 
um i mean i mean this bill doesn't talk about it specifically but i still feel a lot of people will use it and still use it for marketing to sell associated products which may be close to the initial product you would have inquired about or purchased so that will still happen i feel under yeah, getting- and i hope this law dnd gets better by the way so i, I do not want this uh, you know questions for you know like somebody selling me credit card yeah this is just end end of life at an hour so okay so do we have a data portability option uh, no i don't think we are talking about this in this but but from geo to exactly. Airtel, still working out so try try yeah, it will become industry specific i guess yeah what are your your views on penalties okay so let's talk a bit about rights and duties and then we will be also very close to the end of the session so so there are four rights that we see uh, right to information right to correction and erasure right to grievance redressal right to nominate the duties that we have are comply with applicable laws while exercising rights shall not register a false or frivolous grievance furnish any particular or impersonate any other person or furnish furnish only verifiable authentic information so the rights that we have as data principles we have the right to information the right to correction and erasure right to grievance redressal right to nominate and the duties that we have is to obviously comply with applicable existing rights shall not register a false or frivolous grievance furnish any particulars or impersonate any other person uh, furnish only verifiable authentic information so, so cross border transfers will also you know we we have to see uh, adequacy decisions so there is a discussion that is happening you know there's in the law as well that you know there will be countries which will be uh, safe countries right so arvind and akhil should i like to take this up okay so basically yeah, i mean the government is going to come up with certain countries where it's safe to transfer without additional precautions to be taken care i mean it's similar to what the adequacy decision what uh, european commission has come up with so we got to just wait and watch how it happens so uh, akhilesh would you like to take this up like can you summarize data protection board of india right? i don't know what's happening with this data protection authority yeah right so data protection board will be formed like just like any other judicial body they will be responsible for the implementation of privacy providing additional guidances right so just like how we have supervisory authority in the gdpr right we'll have the data protection board in india but well, we got to wait and watch is going to be a legislative body or is going to be an administrative body uh, right so hopefully it's going to be a legislative body and not an administrative body because administrative body can be can can open to a lot of corruptions and stuff like that so we got to wait and watch how this goes yeah i think there's one interesting question in the chat about the people who are diseased right uh, what do you think about that how it is going to applicable in case of indian law there's no explicit mention anywhere except in the right to nominate only in that case they have talked about the deceased but in any other places they never mention anything about the deceased as such perfect guys also if you would like to you know hang on to us and have this discussion ongoing uh, if you have not joined the saros you know whatsapp update privacy update group and there's a link in the chat box you know and there's also a link uh, this is the link that you have you can just click here and just you know just make sure that you stay updated you know with all the privacy updates not just this uh, also a lot more guidances you know we just keep publishing this for free just just click on this and maybe you know if you, if you want to stay in our linkedin groups you can get updated if you want to stay in whatsapp groups you know you can stay updated with us so perfect so that is something that we have in terms of for you grounds for penalty is something that i definitely want to discuss before we end this because this is a this is also a big question that people have asked so uh, any of the speakers you know would like to take about take up ground of penalty and summarize it for everyone arvin yeah so uh, so the ground of penalty is main on i mean penalties as such how would they come up with this up to 500 crores uh the fine can go i mean it, it can go from 250 200 crores even even less sometimes but um, this can be good for some 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 companies can be can go up say extremely wrong for certain companies because there will be small companies who may not be able to afford 200 to 500 crores but uh, when you when when you come up with say bigger companies like your metas or your googles or your bigger companies if they have if they have a fine i mean they will they, they will they will probably be happy to pay 500 crores and just get away with it so uh, this is very ambiguous in general i mean i w- i would have loved to have it the same way the the previous bill was drafted i mean it has to 2 2 to 4% of the global de- de- revenue how gdpr is in general also drafted but yeah i mean some of some of the some of the startups who have been there for some years say about 4 to 5 years or 6 years will probably be more happy with this penalty right now 
Akhilesh. Right. So it's one simple opinion, not as big as GDPR, the fines, but still this, they are a considerable amount. Like when we look at the Indian revenues, so those are still a significant amount of fines have been levied. Yes, 500 here is a lot of money. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a definitely a lot of money. Definitely not talking about thousands of crores, but uh, every every rupee matters in, in the business in India because we are a zero-sum market, right? Interestingly, the market that we work at. So specific penalties for violations, uh, we're talking about something, you know, something that we can point out to and also, you know, just kind of, again, guys, what will also happen is we're going to send this out to you. Uh, we're going to send this session out to you. And uh, what, what, is going to, what is also happening is we're also towards the end of session, uh, but this session will be available. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or Akhilesh or Arvind. It's in this in the chat box. Uh, first of all, thanks a ton to all the speakers to join the session. So thank you for joining the session. First of all, both the speakers uh, and, and thanks a ton you know, for, for coming on, on board and you know, just kind of answering everything. So, so, so over to you, Arvind, for a thank you note. Yeah. Hey, thanks, thanks, uh, Saru, Akash, Sashkant, and to having me here. Uh, it's been a privilege to be part of the session, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, it was informative for for us and for the rest of them uh, because it's it's a learning for both of us, right? For us and for the rest of the folks who joined. Yeah, us. and 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 we have courses like CDDPO uh, just for you know keeping keeping clarity on these laws, right? And just to make sure somebody becomes a privacy professional. So Saru Academy is the thing now, and I, if you wanted to learn something. Just it's just a click away, right? CDPO intermediate is something that is, you know, something highly affordable and can be taken up. Also, we have a session coming up for CDPO Foundation. It is for free, right? It is for free. It is there on Saro Academy's webinar list. Just click there and you know you can just check it out and maybe it will help you out. But yeah, uh, the session. So Akhilesh, what do you? Thank you everyone for joining. Really great questions and really great insights. Thanks, Arvind. Thanks for joining on such a short notice. It was great interacting with you. So thank you. Everyone. No, and, and thank you, everyone. And if your organization wants to see where they are right now, uh, please, you know, please DM us and, and we can, you know, with our existing clientele list, we can just come in and also solve a few problems for you and, and have a nice day, everyone. And thanks for joining the session. And I will stay in touch with all of you.